Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's incredibly humbling and intimidating to be here, um, especially because as a designer who is not really trained in design, uh, I was just asked to put a whole bunch of slides on Keynote and put them in front of a whole bunch of people who probably know a lot more about putting words and images on a page. So uh, I did the only thing uh, a non-designer should do, and I called a designer. Uh, his name is Ricardo. And so everything that you see that is beautiful uh, has nothing to do with anything that I created. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Um, and it's incredibly exciting to be here. I'm from Burnaby, uh, but Vancouver, um, and I don't come home nearly enough. I was so excited that I created about seven hours of content and 700 slides, so we'll, we'll jump right into it. Uh, I'm going to talk today about change, uh, and I'm a designer of change, and I don't really know what that all means either. Uh, we'll try and figure it out together. Uh, but my story starts with, uh, with a story of heartbreak. Um, it's 2008, and you can close your eyes if you want. Um, <laughs> or you can just stare at the black slide. This, this one I did. Ricardo didn't do this one. Um, so it was 2008. I was in, in London, of all places, and had a new girlfriend who I chased there. Um, it was a bit like today, as you can imagine, cold and a bit rainy, as London tends to be. Uh, I was in bet between jobs, uh, which basically meant that it was 1 p.m., I was eating a stale bagel, and I was still in my pajamas uh, <laughs> while everyone was out of the house and at work. Um, and I remember sort of like sitting in the kitchen with no plan in sight for the day, um, as anyone who's been between gigs can, can relate. Um, and I got a call, and it was a, it was a crazy call. Uh, and I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do an English accent, because that was the voice on the line. It was, um, <coughs> Matthew, would you like to build the world's first carbon-neutral city? And literally, not hello, not, not, not anything. And of, of course, I was like, and, you know, what, before I had a chance to ask a question, he said, before you have a chance to ask a question, um, I'm going to email you something. Bring up your computer and look at it. And uh, so I brought up my computer, and this was the image that he sent me. It's the actual one. It's a, it's a photo of Mazdar City. It's in all of Foster and Partners' imagined glory, uh, which is a development in, in Abu Dhabi, which is not like Vancouver in terms of weather. It was um, three months later that I landed there, and it was about 40 degrees and dusty and hot. Um, but I, you know, the, the, with one phone call, I sort of went. Um, in search of this greater passion for sustainability and green building. Uh, Mazdar City was this crazy project. It was funded by the government of Abu Dhabi. It was to be the world's first carbon neutral city, a feat of green engineering. There were going to be driverless cars. And this is 2008, uh, I'll remind you. Um, the city was supposed to be six square kilometers in area. Uh, solar panels were going to line all the rooftops. 99% uh, of the waste was going to be recycled. Um, you know, smart passive ventilation systems were meant to cool the sort of hot Abu Dhabi air in passive ways that weren't energy intensive. Um, and more than anything, it was meant to be like a, a living lab, a clean tech, clean tech hub for innovation, um, which is a pretty good sell um, for someone who's passionate about sustainability. Uh, I said it was supposed to be about six square kilometers, and it's meant to be completed about now. I think t one of the early plans had a, um, completed it in 2015, which would have been last year. And for those of you who have followed Mazdar, you know that some of it's been built, and there are real solar panels on real roofs, and they're ge generating real renewable energy. And uh, there are courtyards that channel wind through these undulating facades, um, and there are buildings that sort of gleam in the sunlight. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, obviously this is a really grand plan, um, as many real estate developments in the Middle East can be. But for me, this was different. This was the dream job. You know, if you could literally think of one thing to do as a 24-year-old unemployed person eating a bagel in an apartment in London, it would have been to be employee number six of, a, of the world's first carbon-neutral city. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Mazdar, you'll probably recognize that it doesn't look quite like this right now. Uh, it's about something like this. So it's less than 1% built by land area. Um, and some people might call that a failure, and I think that's a tricky thing. But, um, 
you know, it, it has been built, and there are beautiful things there, but if you zoom out, it really is sort of this island in, in the middle of the desert, which is where the heartbreak comes in. Um, a lot of people have talked about Mazdar City in a lot of different ways, and how it's overly ambitious, and how it had no commercial sense, and the designers were sort of into science fiction, and were having a laugh, and somebody decided to build it, which all might be true to a certain extent. Um, but there are still people doing important work there, and, and really pushing it forward. And, for those, one of the most common questions I get is, uh, what's happening now? And they are, we, I visited with Jamie, not Jamie, uh, from, a friend from Abu Dhabi a few months ago, uh, and they're building, and they're building new buildings and doing important work, very slowly, and a more, uh, that's my sister, so I have to give her a hard time. <laughs> Literally, f f those 50 new people are all people from Burnaby that I like, either went to high school with or are related to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll stay silent for a couple more seconds to make her feel awkward. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because there are a lot of reasons why Mazdar could have failed. Because of business reasons, because of design reasons, because of the engineering, because it was ambitious, because of leadership. But uh, as employee number six, uh, I saw the organization grow from six employees to 250, back down to a few dozen in two years, which, if you could, which is to me like the biggest failures. Uh, this, this was not only my hope, hope and dream and my dream job, it was many other people's. And the reason why I, th I think it's failed, and I'm completely biased, so this is not some sort of scientific analysis, but um, it wasn't because the business conditions weren't right. I, you know, I was the one in front of the financial models, and I saw the conservative assumptions. Uh, and we were funded by the government of Abu Dhabi, so conceivably, if it was profitable and successful, there could have been money. Uh, and I worked with some of the most brilliant scientists and designers and engineers, that I've ever met, and a lot of them have been extremely successful today. There are a lot of ingredients for success, but I think where we were missing sort of the conditions for success was how to work together in this novel way, and we would, uh, we would do what any well-funded um, company does, and we hired a management consultant, and they would come and say, oh, you're kind of like a civic government, why don't we organize this way? And we we're kind of like, well, we're not really. And, and th we'd, then we'd bring in management consultant B, and they'd be like, you're kind of like a real estate developer, but we're not really. Or you're kind of like a tech company, you're kind of like all these different things. And I think uh, what was familiar to them was familiar models of organizing, of working together, not some crazy carbon neutral city in the middle of the desert. And sort of that moment that I realized that like, that was the problem that wasn't being worked on. It wasn't the solar panel that was hyper efficient that I could contribute to uh, in a greater sense of purpose way. Uh, it was how we organize to sort of work together through change and through innovation. And that didn't really mean that there was a job for me to doing that. Like organizing for creativity and innovation and change. And, uh, and it was a few years after Mazdar when I came across IDEO. And I was fortunate enough to just start nerding out about innovation and organizing for innovation. At a similar time when IDEO started nerding out about organizing for innovation in a serious way. Um, and we talked about how how, uh, how I'm a designer. And I'm really like, every time I say the word designer in reference to me, I will put air quotes up because, uh, and if you want, I can like sketch something after this talk and you see how bad I am at like anything remotely near visual. Um, but IDEO has this point of view that, that change can be designed, uh, which is interesting. We'll speak a little bit more about what, what that means. Uh, IDEO exists to, and we say this with a straight face, to create disproportionate impact through design. That's what gets us up in the morning. That's why people, um, especially in the Silicon Valley, like, choose to take jobs at IDEO instead of the other exciting places to work. Uh, and that means a lot of things. Through our legacy, there's this narrative of, we are an industrial design firm that build hard products in, in beautiful ways. One of our like, claims to fame is uh, designing the first Apple mouse. Or we'll do you know, chairs, which are you know, real craft, material science, industrial design, or. Uh, the first non-leather brook saddle we, we did as well. And then over time, uh, we kind of realized that pro for products to live successfully in the world, as innovative as they were, we needed service models to support them. So we did things like HBO Go and Bank of America's Keep the Change program, and we designed a new service model for, for Walgreens, um, or like the London drugs of the States. Um, and then there's a natural evolution that our same methods, our same design thinking methods, could help us support our ideas in the world even further when we started designing organizations and systems. So whether it's an innovation accelerators uh, in Europe, the Zalando Studios is, is an amazing stu innovation studio for the, the Zappos of Europe. 
that's going on right now. It's super exciting. We designed whole school systems in Peru uh, with ANOVA. And now, still with a straight face, uh, we're, we have this ambition to have disproportionate impact through design by designing movements. So we did a project with Jamie Oliver on, on food, and this is my favorite one where um, we tried to design, we are designing the future of Judaism, cultural Judaism, with a group of thought leaders in San Francisco. Uh, I belong to a studio, hold on to that thought for a second, I knew you have questions. <laughs> um, I belong to a studio called Design for Change. Uh, we focus mostly on the systemic side of our sort of like product to movement evolution. Um, so I still haven't told you what I do yet and I still don't understand it, um, but I'm sure you're wondering like, how do you design Judaism? <laughs> um, how can you design change? It's so intangible. Uh, and part of why I'm here is to sort of explain to my friends and family what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> and even within IDEO, there's confusion over what this is. This evolution, you can, you can understand, they're, they're real hard product design people who are sort of um, old school IDEOers in this really sort of like character way. So a colleague of mine actually went around in, in our studio, Design for Change, and asked what, what, what other people at IDEO think we do. And there's a variety of answers. Some people kind of got it. It's less about physical products, more about changing people's behaviors. That's as good. It's, it's kind of like defining creativity. It's, it, there's no real good answers. But some people understand it more. Some people understand it less. Some people were a little bit were interested but confused, or aware but confused. Uh, this person gave tours of the office, and we have like a tour stop for Design for Change, and they're like, ah, I don't know. I usually just point at the picture. <laughs> um, and yet others were even more confused, if not a little bit skeptical. You can imagine it's a tougher crowd in, it was in between our walls than it is outside of our walls. And I think that's fair. I think that's fair. So um, we're here. We're going to talk about a little bit about what that means about designing change. Um, so, so the thing that relates back to our product legacy is like, why do products fail to get to market? There's so many good ideas. At IDEO, you see so many good ideas, and we're famous for like throwing post-its at the wall and having zany ideas. But really, our, our like, there's no shortage of great ideas out in the world, and, and our value is less about that and more about finding ways to get them into the world. Um, but the thing is, the new products rely on new ways of working, and again, just like the Mazda City example, that's where that's where we see a lot of our clients fall short. Uh, one of my favorite stories about uh, designing change is actually a story I learned in business school. We learn interesting things in business school, I swear. Crickets, again. Any mention of business school. Silence. It's not so bad. Um, it's called Gunfire at Sea, and it takes a place in the 1800s. Um, there was, uh, it's a story about the US Navy, and at the time, they're the, the largest Navy in the world. They're taking on the Spanish Navy. Um, they're very powerful, um, but as you can imagine, it was the 1800s, and um, sorry, I thought it was me for the first second there. Um, their, the, their technology wasn't really great, so they had a cannon that shot uh, at enemy ships, and their accuracy rate was about 1 in 100, which in the 1800s is pretty good. Um, There's a general that came along, Lieutenant Sims, and he had this new technology, this new way of shooting cannons. Um, and, but he was a bit removed from the headquarters. He was stationed in the Sea of China. And so um, from his post, he had this idea, you know, it's going to increase the accuracy. I think it was like 8,000%. Something unfathomable. It was, was going to be 8 out of 10 from like 1 out of 100. So he had this new technology. He tested it. He sent the idea. Um, oh, sorry. He... Uh, I have a slide that says 3,000%, just to emphasize that. He sent the idea from the Sea of China back to headquarters. And uh, this graphic works. I'll blame Ricardo for any... Oh, yeah, there we go. That was Ricardo. <laughs> and you can imagine the idea just didn't go anywhere. So he mustered up more evidence, like thought a little bit more about what could be, how to sort of be evidence-based, and really convincing, wrote a white paper, sent it back. And that happened. <laughs> um, and so you can imagine Lieutenant Sims, and that's him, was increasingly demotivated. <laughs> uh, and in an act of desperation, he sent a letter to the President of the United States, 
about his technology. And in this crazy you know, uh, stroke of luck, the president saw it, um, you know, uh, said, we have to do this right away, appointed him lieutenant, super general, I don't even know what Navy titles are, and managed that everyone implement the solution. Great success. Hurrah, eight out of 10, um, aside the fact from, from the fact that it was war and all these types of things. Um, but it's interesting to think, like, that's a really rare scenario. And I think, you know, this was the Navy, but you can probably relate if you've ever worked for a big company, if you've ever lived in a big family. Like, sometimes it's hard for your voice to be heard. And you can think about, like, what are the factors that uh, got in the way of Lieutenant Sims' revolutionary, revolutionary idea? Uh, from being implemented. You can think about like the structure of the military is not really conducive to people from the field coming up with new ideas. Uh, and the infrastructure, he was physically located uh, really far away in the 1800s. They didn't have Insta, what did you call it? Insta grandma twit? <laughs> they didn't have that. Uh, the direction, the sort of North Star of purpose and values of the Navy at the time was so much emphasized towards honor and sort of like human bravery that uh, this idea of like technology sort of being a, a sort of like cheat uh, didn't really sort of direct ideas towards success. Uh, the there was a sort of implication around talented roles where it had been scary to retrain gunners to, to think about new technology and uh, based on everything they had learned, uh, have to flip things around. And there wasn't really a process to listen to people in the field. I think every organization has these conditions. You can see an analog for, for any big company or small company or even partnership. That like, these conditions are really complicated to foster whether or not an idea get a good idea gets to the people it needs to. So this is what we mean by organizational design. It's designing the conditions that encourage desi desired behaviors in its simplest form. There are a lot of conditions that uh, Lieutenant Sims could have enjoyed uh, to see his idea be successful. And those conditions are designable. So the whole thing, you know, I think I said, you know, change is designable. I kind of lied, it's not. It's really hard to design change. But you can design the, the conditions so that change is, are, is possible. Uh, when we think about designing change, we think about this framework called the circle of purpose. Uh, and often a client comes to us with like a product or a service that they want. Uh, they're really outcome. They, we want to be more innovative, or we want uh, like 10 new products in the market today. And really, when they want to build capabilities, it comes down to actual behaviors. So we want to be more innovative. We want our people to come up with their own ideas. We want to have a lab that can uh, process ideas and, and test them on users. Um, but it's really hard to design outcomes. You can't, it's like designing change. You can't design outcomes. It's really hard to design behaviors. No matter what I want, I can't stop the way my sister sneezes. Um, <laughs> but what you can do is set the conditions. And you can and align people to a, a common purpose that guides them towards change. So the opportunities for design and change are really around purpose and the levers that you can design in terms of conditions. We, there are six of them that we identify that are really common. It's fairly common in sort of organizational psychology. psychology. Uh, incentives, you can sort of incentivize the right behaviors so that ideas proliferate. Talent, you, making, you can make sure that you have the right people and that they're trained the right ways. Processes, you can make sure that, that people relate to each other in, in, in ways that are conducive to innovation. Strategy, structure, you make sure the reporting lines are loose enough but firm enough so that people have access to the right people. Uh, and infrastructure, whether it's the physical locations, the tools you have, um, or, the, pro or uh, the internal programs that you have. And you can start to see how these things you can design. You can design, my, my big test is can you design it is can you have an app for that? You can have an app for any of these things. <laughs> you can also build a physical manifestation of these things. And this is where the, where the role of design comes into play and change. Uh, we call this the circle of purpose. Uh, and the thing that we want you to hold on to is the fact that like, Designing these conditions is a creative activity. That's where designers meet designers. Um, and where Design for Change really thinks about its role is actually designing the spectrum of the products and services, organizations and movements that set the condition for change. 
Um, and I think it's important to note that you know, we celebrate change, and change is this lofty word, but it is really complex. You know, organizations are really complex. Uh, change, if you've ever had like, a change management consultant come into your workplace, that is very disruptive at its best, difficult most of the times, and scary at its worst. But I think that's the role of, of design in change, is that we have this point of view that designers have this unique ability um, to convey and design these conditions for change that, uh, that industry is typically ignored. There are a couple different ways, and I'm going to speak through the lens of some of the work we've done. Uh, the first way is designers create this, are able, uniquely able to create this beautiful vision of the future, of an imagined future that can inspire and provoke change. Uh, this is a project we did for a major, major apparel brand on diversity and inclusion, which is a, a tough topic to talk about, you know. Uh, it's a, and it's also one that is talked about a lot, but not a lot, lot's been done, or nobody really sees the future. And to their credit, in this sort of hard-charging, hard sort of athletic environment, um, they were able to, we were able to paint a picture of their own employees uh, to see how their needs might be met through, through change. Sometimes the first thing you need to do with change is just listen. Designers are also really interesting because we can bring non-designers, or de designers, uh, along with our process to empower them to sort of build and prototype and make their ideas tangible. This is a project we did uh, with the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, and I must disclaim that none of our ideas are out in the world, so if you are through Pearson, do not blame us. Um, <laughs> But, it, but to their credit, it does show the power of prototyping and bringing foam core to life and, and at raising interesting questions around um, behavior and what's possible. And that's understandable by all, even people who can't sketch. Uh, and the other thing is designers can inspire and build creativ uh, creative capacity in others. By being, you know, and I'm so privileged to be able to sit next to these brilliant designers every day. Um, you know, being next to them is, is inherently contagious and, Embracing change like an ambiguity like designers naturally do uh, is, is like an under, undermined talent. This is a project we did with La Victoria Lab, which is um, for uh, a, a company called Intercorp in Peru. Uh, wealthy billionaires saw all these social opportunities um, within Peru uh, and set up this umbrella company with 29 distinct companies. And so we have a lab where all those 29 companies can come, we can funnel new ideas. We've cycled ideas, and we've hired lab people there um, to sort of really be an engine for, for creativity and change. And sometimes just cycling people from those 29 companies into the lab uh, can really inspire them for their work at hand. So this is all very lofty, and you can design big systems and big organizations and movements. You can design Ju Judaism if you think about the conditions that would pro change, uh, that provoke change. But it's important to think that, to realize that like, change can also start really small. Um, I wanted to come back to Mazdar City. Um, there are all kinds of like, technological things about Mazdar City that I'm really proud of. This is a wind tunnel that funnels um, the wind from above and cycles it through what would other be fairly blocked off narrow streets. Um, <laughs> And at its best, it photographs very well uh, with the right photographer. But my favorite image from Mazdar is actually this one, um, which is low resolution uh, and is of a staircase. Um, so the story, the, the story about this is uh, it's like my one contribution, my biggest contribution to design. Uh, and I didn't design this, don't, don't get me wrong. But we were, it was like a one hour meeting where we were talking about uh, the entry statement. So you can imagine. You're going to Mazdar City. There's a driverless car that picks you up. You're embraced with this underground tunnel that, where you go in a loop um, underground. You, um, you, the sort of like temperature is moderated. Everything where there's solar panels. There's all these sort of hard things to be impressed by. And you arrive. You get out of the driverless car. You walk into the hallway, and this is like our hotel lobby, if you will. It's our entry statement. And we had this sort of one-hour argument at Mazdar with a multidisciplinary team over over initial concept design that, had, that looked a little bit like a hotel lobby. It was sort of grand, not that different than this, except for facing straight, you had an elevator bay, as you would in most hotel lobbies. Uh, and there was an alternative design pitched that was a little bit closer to this, where it had the stairway. And I said, well, why, why would you do that? And the designer said, um, 
well, you know, we're trying to be the world's first carbon neutral city, and this isn't revolutionary in architecture by any means, but why don't we just encourage people to take the stairs? It takes less energy. It sort of like symbolizes the behavior that we're trying to encourage. And it's cheap, you know? And we had all these arguments about you know, people saying that stairs can't be beautiful, and I think these are, uh, that, that like, it, it was unwelcoming, um, that it wasn't the entry statement that we wanted to make, people wouldn't, would be disoriented. So the one thing I fought for, and it was a matter of like drawing a line with two arrows that switched the elevator bay and the staircase, um, was this. And people actually really didn't care about it, but I really cared about it. And I think it's symbolic of like how literally all, all I fought for in terms of change was like this stairway, flipping it, and you can see if you squint uh, to the left, there's a, there's a small door where there's an elevator bay, there's access. But those are the types of change, changes and conditions that in the grand scheme of Mazdar City, where we're spending billions of dollars on hard technology, a simple staircase actually can change behavior. I went back, like I said, a few months ago and asked the, the facilities manager, you know, who, does anyone take the elevator? And they say, basically no one. And they don't, and they don't even mention it. Um, so even a stair, building a staircase is a, a big endeavor for most of us who don't sort of like, can't just draw on a piece of paper and it appears magically and beautifully and spiraled in concrete. But you can think about your own lives in terms of what are the small interventions that you can do to provoke conditions for someone else to have change. A lot of times when we go into research, it's literally just having a conversation with someone new, someone who, whose voice isn't heard. One of the things that we give uh, our clients usually on kickoffs or, or really lighthearted uh, like initial conversations, is this tea kit. And so the tea kit is a little box and it's beautifully designed. I think it was probably by Ricardo as well. Um, you open the box and there's a, there's a bag of tea, which is inexpensive. Uh, and there's a card that just says like, you know, open this at three o'clock, or on top it says, open this at three o'clock. And instructions to say, like, have a conversation with someone you never had a conversation with in your company. Talk about your job. Talk about what you would like for your job and ask them what they would like for their job. And you know, it's, it's crazy, because in these big organizations, like, it's phenomenal how just people having a conversation with someone they, intention, like, they haven't had a conversation with, with some intention, with like, the lightest prompts ever, can start a conversation about what is your purpose? What are the structures that get in the way of you doing your job? What are the infrastructural things that you could have um, that would enable you to be more creative, more innovative? So think about what is the smallest intervention you could possibly have, even today. We, we can do it at 3 o'clock if you want. Um, and we can talk a bit afterwards if you want to want some, some ideas. So change is really hard, uh, and we acknowledge that. They're like, you know, when it, it is a story of heartbreak when you're dealing with people's lives, and our research oftentimes is, you know, you can imagine going in and talking to someone about diversity and inclusion in a company where they felt like they really adore, but they've been sort of beat down by the system and are, are disadvantaged, change can be really hard. Uh, but we believe in a version that can be really beautiful, too. Um, there's a version of change that feels a little bit more, I have to be careful when I say this, but uh, like a business school textbook, uh, where there are boxes and lines, and there are people moving, and it's pretty de dehumanizing. If people get laid off in these situations, people have new bosses, people are put in situations where um, they don't know what they're doing and they're not set up for success. The type of change that we try to design by designing the conditions for change is not like a mandated version of this is what you're going to do. It's about this is your North Star, this is your purpose, this is the direction that we all want to go. This is your purpose beyond profit sometimes, this is what drives you to, to come to work. It's your version of we, you want to create disproportionate impact through design. And these are the conditions that will give you to set you up for success in that direction. So the analogy that we really like to come back to is it's a bit like gardening. You, know? you can't like design a flat. Well, maybe I'm always sort of aware that rooms like this, there are some pretty impressive people who might understand the botany behind manufacturing a flower. But most of us can't design a flower. But you can give it good soil. You can make sure it's placed in the sunlight. You can water it regularly. You can tend to whether it's being overwatered or underwatered. And that's the version of change that we aspire for. It's a really human version of change that we think is really beautiful. Thank you.
Uh, hi, Matthew. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I, I have kind of two questions that are somewhat related. One, I was wondering what you thought about um, the term nudges. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And then the other kind of maybe a, book, a little right? more controversial is what do you think about growth hacking? And does that sort of relate to this at all? Uh, yeah, I think um, like organizational design as a design craft doesn't really exist. You know, we're kind of making this up as we go. And um, it's, it's, it's very much a designer's craft to learn from the outside world and what, learn from what does exist. So we, I make fun of like organizational psychology and textbooks, but we do learn from that. And I make, you know, we do learn, uh, especially from behavioral economics. I think that, that was the book, like not the book. Um, and you think about impacting human behavior at scale, you know, we reinvent the wheel a lot, but sometimes it's not necessary, or at least to use that as a building point. Uh, and growth hacks are great. I think, that, like, the, I love the word hack as a sort of mentality for, like, the sort of last message of, like, change can start small. Like, hack is, is accessible. Like, designing change is not. And so I think, like, having a hack mentality covers everything that we design, whether it's a product or service or organization system or movement. Yeah. yeah. Next question. Um, what inspires you about organizations, Matthew? Like, what, what about this career you've chosen? Yeah, it's cool because it gets like, uh, gets kind of like heady and brainy, which I kind of like. Um, especially, so IDEO's methods are often to get inspired by the outside world, like I just mentioned. And so you can think of all the sort of like major behavioral economics trends and think about, uh, I get really inspired by, uh, a company called Opower that uses behavioral economics to change energy consumption behavior. Uh, and this isn't all they did, but they literally just like redesigned the utility bill uh, using behavioral economics principles. And you know, they've saved, we, had a, we, we, took them, we took a client there for inspiration. The client was like this big like transportation NGO. They do like big uh, bus rapid transit programs, really hard you know, infrastructural like sustainable uh, transportation programs. And Opower is like, we, change the way a utility bill likes and we've reduced more carbon than you have. Uh, so it's sort of like these scalable impact things that out in the world get really inspiring. The other thing we get really inspired by is like systems at large and so like that gets really heady and weird and we get inspired a lot by, by nature. You know, like nature is this amazing ability to create these complex systems that solve for uh, these directional problems. We have these cards um, called biomimicry cards and so like mimicking how nature and, and lichen gets sort of like efficient and productive in, in how they sort of produce. Um, you can get really heady and inspiring. You can go into, out into the world and, get, and see like your work and everything, you know? It's, that's kind of what I like. Um, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to change a large like government system? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, <laughs> in 15 minutes or less. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, um, starts with post-it notes. So I think, uh, I'm going to try to not get myself in trouble. The first five things would get me in trouble that can't get me in trouble. Uh, elect the right pres uh, prime minister, or president, in this in, which is perhaps more timely. Uh, I think... Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about was constraints. And there are inherent constraints in any organization that you're trying to change. These are people's lives. First of all, these are people's lives. That should be the first constraint. It's like, we can talk about experimentation and nerd out about it, but these are people's lives that you're trying to change. And so be considerate of that and also design for them. Um, I, I bet, I bet that there's like a ton of, like everyone working at government has like a bunch of ideas. I bet you like, this is one of those cases where generating ideas is not the problem. It's actually thinking about uh, having the right voices heard in the right way. So maybe it's about like bringing those voices to life. So I might start, like design thinking often starts with listening. So, um, you know, that literally one of our presentations, oh, the, that uh, major apparel company project. Um, <laughs> um, the, the first thing we did to, to the CEO of that major apparel company was literally show them quotes, like 10 quotes, from people who worked at their company that they care about. Um, and I think the disconnect is often such that like, leaders don't hear the truth that happens on the ground. So, what, 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 you know, and we, you know, we used design, we made beautiful videos, we sort of like brought them to life, we were carefully curated, they had a sort of a narrative, the art of storytelling. You can do things with just like listening, 
that is often really a good start. Um, the other thing that we encourage, and it's harder in government, because it's a very, it's a mandates place, is, uh, is thinking about what are the ways you can hack culture or change in your organization that aren't controversial? What if it's just like, how can we hack lunchtime? <laughs> That's often like a place where you start. There's a lot of food, like tea or lunchtime. Um, to convene a conversation, you know? That's in an un uncontroversial way. Like, what if we could do lunchtime differently as a proof of concept for how we can start thinking about just like doing things differently? Yeah, it's hard. Um, the important thing with starting small is also to sort of develop momentum. Uh, and then you start to think about what, how can we sort of like let people know about the work that we're doing, starting campaigns. I don't know how, we, how else we would do it though. It's, yeah, it'd be a fun project. Hi. Hi. It's my first time here. Thanks. I got a question already. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, enjoy, <laughs> enjoyed your presentation. Um, my name's Derek. I work in the video game industry. Um, but I have a question for you. How did you, like, at what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to do this? And when that switch went off, how did you go about finding the right place that could, so that it would open up that for you? Mm, yeah, I mean, the, the story was carefully crafted and it like, skipped four years of my life between Mastar and, and starting as an organizational designer at Audio. I think um, it was a windy path and I think being prepared for that is, is important. But you can design the sort of like conditions for your own life. And so um, I was like, you know, what are the tools that I want in my tool belt to sort of like work at a growing organization where I have tangible skills? And I strangely ended up working in finance for you know, business school, but created a hush amongst the crowd. I worked in finance for two years. Um, but for this, this company that modestly was trying to, to do uh, like investing differently, trying to be sort of like less about handing money to private equity funds and more about sort of like fundamental value and allocating capital around the world, they were quick growing. So I was like, well, you know, that's the closest thing proximally to my skill set, but it's also the conditions that I need to learn in terms of growth, in terms of sort of like smart people um, being around. Uh, I ended up going to business school. Um, so there are times when education becomes like what you need to do. And for me, that was right. And business school was definitely not right for everyone. But for me, it was great. Um, but the, the, the underlying motivating factor was just like, I'm just going to nerd out. Like, I can only nerd out so much working in finance and organizations. I'm just going to nerd out on organizations. And business school is really career oriented. Like, they really point you towards like, find a career, see career, kill career, you know, like. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of like, I'm just going to nerd out on organizational design and innovation. And that's not a job. And um, I did that persistently enough. And talked and nerded out with enough people to find some people who are like-minded. So it does take, I'm so grateful in it, and, and it was a lot of serendipity, but I think there's something to be said for just like nerding out on what you're passionate about and hoping for the best. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm Zane. I'm the new uh, head of video content for the digital publication Van City Buzz. Oh, and cool. when we talk about the government situation where the system's in place, here there's an opportunity where there's nothing in place. Hmm. So what I really admired or what caught me was the oh, hexagon you had there, when you had the talent and then there was the structures and the processes which we don't have. So what would you recommend for kind of fast tracking when there is no system in place, when you don't really know what your objective is because hmm. it's like it's open sky, yeah. but to get everybody on board, hmm. you kind of need to come up with something that can change, but right now there needs to be something so they can all get behind what would you recommend for kind of getting that system in yeah. place? Uh, first of all, that's exciting. So it's a good time to be there. I think uh, another thing, you know, it's interesting when you put things in a honeycomb shape. It sounds very formal, um, but, and you probably don't maybe have all those systems in place. But there is, like, all those things happen in an informal way between people. It's just like human truths, right? Like, there is informal structure in this room. Like, I'm standing at the front. Mark's standing there. People are facing me. Um, I think the first thing you can do is, like, People adapt to the system uh, in like hacked ways, you know. And so the first thing you could do is like really understand how people are hacking the system to create informal, um, a form, informal organizational structure. Uh, and what can, from that is like good, and you want to formalize and build that. What from that is actually just like they're making up for like the chaos in your company. You need to design for that. So it's, it's again, it's sort of like I think of organizational design often like our discovery or research process is like dropping a glow-in-the-dark pinball in a dark pinball machine. So you kind of follow like, what people are already doing, and you sort of like, run into a wall here, and that stops something, or you run into an alleyway where things flow really quickly. 
And if you drop enough pinballs and sort of listen to enough people or follow enough processes, you can kind of get a picture of what the pinball machine looks like, um, and if you map it and keep track of it. And I think I would start with like a mapping mentality of understanding what's already happening in terms of structures and processes, and then design for like a smoother pinball machine. Yeah. Okay, guys, it's already 10, <clears throat> so I need to have one more question and then wrap, wrap us up, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure it's awesome, but we've had all the questions from the front, so I'm, I'm gonna invite somebody from the back half of the room to have a, to our, our last question. Thanks, Matt. So your, your circle of, of change uh, works backward, outcomes, a process, the structure, but it starts at an ideal or an idea or a motivation or, or a principle. Um, Nippon Meta, a Bay Area neighbor of yours from Service Space, who you may know, did a great TED Talk called Designing for Generosity, mm. uh, which I recommend to everyone, incidentally. Um, and his, princ his principle is that also that you have to start at the ideal. But what do we do in organizational design, in behavioral design, in life design, when so many of the structures within which we work are based on ideals that don't reflect our true values anymore. They, re they reflect uh, the values of entrenched power structures that are very um, self-supporting and self-sustaining <laughs> and make it difficult to attack the very place that you say that change needs mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. um, first, first you elect the right official. It's, it's, it's like the... the <laughs> It's like the government question. I think uh, it's so valid, though. It's so valid. I think there's a, there's a point where uh, we have to clarify, like, hey, big company X, your mission statement, not always your purpose, at least not your real one. And there's, like, like you can almost play mission statement bingo, and, if it, like, they all sound the same, you know? They're all, like, elevated, blah, 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 for impact at scale, and they sound a little bit uh, like ours. I think um, it's hard. I think... Part of your question was about the purpose itself. Part of the question was about um, articulating the purpose and leadership structures around like redefining that purpose. Um, you know, IDEO can't help all companies. And in fact, there's a, it takes a lot of conditions for us to be successful as companies. One of the things that we need is uh, the right leader or the right contact point. And they don't have to be the person at the top, but they have to be the right champion for, for change. Um, I think that the misconception, though, is that that person has to be the CEO or the chairman or the prime minister. Um, that's where we can learn from movements, you know? Uh, you don't necessarily need the purpose right away, but if you could, like, you don't, it hasn't be, doesn't have to be crisp and articulated in a mission statement that you could put on your wall, but if there's, a, like, a felt purpose that is real, that, you know, even in this room we could do it, um, that is common that people will rally around, then that's the start of sort of like a seed of change. And then you can start taking action around that. And then you can articulate it better. And then it sort of like takes momentum that, that if there are different difficult leadership structures they have to pay attention to. It's hard. It's hard. It's not so like, oh, let's rally around, redesign lunch, then we redesign the meeting, then the government of Canada is better. Um, <laughs> but but it's, there are steps along the way about um, taking a movement mentality. And it's almost a whole other presentation of like, what can we learn from movements? Uh, in our corporate structures. Thank you. It was a really great. That was awesome. Great Thank you. So. Uh, thank you.